sickle cell disease has been described as one of the most neglected global health diseases. And I don't think it takes an imaginative answer to have a, a rationale for why people who are of color, who have often been colonized, have the healthcare needs, the last on the list of public health services. It's a global tragedy, frankly, uh, that no one is paying attention. Actually, the first case of sickle cell disease in India was first uh, observed in 1952. People didn't know that uh, India is a high uh, burden sickle cell area. And now we know that the three countries, among three countries, Congo, Nigeria, the third one is India, this was not known a decade ago. Sickle cell disease is most affected by an original geographical map where malaria was endemic. Uh, it's actually quite common to get malaria in Africa, particularly West Africa, in the Middle East, in the Mediterranean countries, and also in India. In those regions, malaria was prolific, and there was a survival advantage for those children who had sickle cell trait. And then when two individuals with sickle cell trait get together and have a child, there's a one in four chance that that child will have sickle cell disease. Of course, because of uh, enslavement, there was mass uh, migration, forced migration to uh, the United States and South America. And then in the absence of the forced migration, enslavement, there's been selective migration where people with uh, sickle cell trait have elected to live all over the world. And now uh, I, I dare say there are a few countries uh, that don't have any sickle cell disease at all. The challenge of being a uh, person of African descent who has also devoted his professional career to improving the lives of children in the United States who are of African descent with sickle cell disease and adults, uh, those children who grow up, um, become young adults. I see this as uh, a double-edged sword. On one hand, I'm, I'm able to be part of a dream uh, that I've shared uh, with my wife and my family. And on the other hand, I'm having to deal with the, the challenges of the bigotry and the systematic racism. But I remain hopeful that in the end, the good science will prevail and will have had an impact and we will continue to have an impact on improving the lives of children and adults with sickle cell disease, not just in uh, North America, uh, but also uh, throughout the world. My name is Luimba Kasongo and I'm a sickle cell patient based in Zambia. I have been living with sickle cell for 41 years now. If you compare to the sickle cell disease treatment in Western countries or in European countries, the service and the care there is much better. They get their medication for free. They get their hydroxyl for free. They have access to their pain meds at the hospital without even having to explain because they already know that sickle cell disease, this is what patients need and require. But when it comes to Africa, um, the facilities are not as good. There's only hydroxyra and the anti-malaria. The treatment is available, but there are parts like sub-Saharan Africa where the health system is already crumbled. In my city, because it's the main city, we have the blood transfusion programs, but that's just in the city. What about in the rural areas, okay? And even in my city, we used to get emergency care treatment. It takes a lot. You have to scream the whole night until our health system uh, begins to recognize that sickle cell disease is a very painful condition that needs to be managed immediately. Uh, we will continue to to not have the best care and be sidelined. I haven't been in the hospital admission, as in a hospital admission, in close to eight years now because of hydroxyria. <laughs> So it's a game changer. I really wish that when we do get the opportunity to have funding, uh, this drug can be available at no cost in every part of the world, in the villages, in Philippines, in wherever sickle cell is, in India, 
Brazil, name it. Healthcare in the U.S. is complicated. The number one challenge for healthcare for children and adults with sickle cell disease is poverty. Pure and simple. Anywhere between 60 to 80 percent of the children and adults with sickle cell disease will have what we refer to as Medicaid, which is insurance provided by the state. All children's hospitals in the United States will take Medicaid. But the moment those children become young adults, it becomes a process a little bit like Ulysses, looking for something you can't find. Because the reality is that most adult providers do not render care for adults with Medicaid. I started my career in pediatrics in 1981. And till 1983, I found that any time of the year, um, our indoor patients, almost 40% of them would be children with sickle cell And they were people who were uh, not understanding much about the disease. And there were no special clinics available for them, like other diseases. They used to come for tablet folic acid. That was the only thing available for sickle cell patients. In those days, folic acid was very cheap. Just in 100 rupees, I could give them folic acid, all my patients of sickle cell disease, for a month. I think today, over 40 years, four decades, uh, we have every possible thing in our clinic, except a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. I started with around 20 patients. Now today, my patients would be like truck all over India. The system wasn't really set up to say, here's a doc that takes care of you for 20 years of your life. And all of a sudden, they're gonna transfer you over to a doctor who's never taken care of you at all. You gotta download 20 years of experience with a single provider to another provider. And that system doesn't work. That's a major challenge is this transition of care. One thing we have seen is newborn screening is visible in the remotest part of India. We have done in tribal, in rural, with different methods, and it was visible. So we've got the reports. But then, what next? Only two centers did a follow of those patients who were homozygous. There's a group, small group of uh, healthcare professionals who are immersed in understanding the challenges of providing medical care uh, for pregnant women with sickle cell disease, uh, newborns with sickle cell disease. And then the vast majority, I would say 99% of the healthcare providers are totally uh, oblivious uh, to the challenges that uh, this patient population faces. Why is this a problem? Because as we have pointed out in our work in Ghana, one in 10, one in 10 women, before we started doing our work as a multidisciplinary team, died during pregnancy. You're talking 10,000 deaths per 100,000 live births. Just to give you a comparator, in the US, the maternal mortality rate is 26 deaths per 100,000 live births. The women in the United States are upset with that number, and rightfully they should be. So I I don't understand why uh, United Nations, WHO, UNICEF are not outraged about this number and the fact that women are dying unnecessarily as a result of a lack of knowledge and a lack of care. In my family, I'm the only one with sickle cell disease. Reality hit me when I started going to school. I was mocked for my yellow eyes. I was mocked for being so skinny. And I never used to finish school terms. I would be in and out of hospital. When I went to college, I hid my condition because I didn't want to go through what I went through in high school. I've met full-grown adults that will still mock me over my condition. It's actually crazy to think that somebody can look at you and make those insensitive statements based on a condition that you didn't even ask for. The public will only go with what um, is being spoken and talked about. And if you 
sickle cell disease that not reach that platform where we have a speaking uh, opportunity at WHO or UN or all these uh, global platforms, then it's difficult for the health system uh, to enhance it. Aside from advocacy, I am an artist, a visual artist. Um, I paint and I draw. So art for me started a long time ago. When I was admitted in hospital, for me it was just a, a coping mechanism really. Now with hydroxyria, of course, things are much better, but still, it's very therapeutic for me. There are many myths, cultural beliefs, which are the preventing patients from coming to the healthcare center, and uh, because there is a stigma associated. So I think one very important challenge for me today is what I've learned over years, how to do counseling after awareness and giving them examples like this is a disease like blood pressure, which they very well know. Take proper medicine, do proper monitoring, you'll be fine. Give them examples of my patient. See, this patient is 40 years old and he can take part in a car race. Only thing you have to be taking proper treatment and comply. That social stigma is a very big challenge for us. Even with the doctors, the medical doctors, many times they have uh, wrong beliefs about hydroxyurea. So I think we have to educate them also. That's what led me to now start visiting sickle cell patients. They would say, Wimba was here. I can't even believe that she's 40. I didn't know that my child could grow to that age, you know. I even started celebrating like my birthday in the world. I talked to the doctors at the hospital. I said, I want to come and do a health talk for sickle cell disease to teach mothers how to manage their children and also to help them walk through the journey because it's most difficult at the beginning. You know, it hits you. Uh, from nowhere. There was an announcement in February 23 in India. Eliminate sickle cell by 2047. We have formed uh, modules for caretakers, parents, teachers. I think we never talk about teachers and I think one of the challenges I face well, for my patients are teachers. They are drop out from school because of Teachers are not aware of sickle cell disease. So I'm very happy about it that with uh, these other initiatives, India has come out with this mission project and is uh, working very fast to achieve it. I see the future, it's the beginning and the future of sickle cell disease in India is bright. But then there are many challenges because the burden is very large and we have to take lots of efforts to reach the last mile in our country. When I look back, working for the Lancet Hematology Commission on Pickles and Disease was a great experience. And more than that, today I realize it's going to help me so much when I am having a elimination program for sickle cell disease in my country. I'll give you another example as to why I see a very bright future. Sickle cell disease events, researchers, doctors, um, policymakers are now involving the patient voice in their planning, in their research. The patient voice is key to achieving that which they wish to do for sickle cell disease. I'm cautiously optimistic. I recognize, and all of us in the field recognize, that there are competing interests. And often those competing interests are not focused on the greater good of the children and the adults with this disease. And so I, I have to be a little cautious because when people come knocking on the door saying, we have X for you, we have Y for you, we want to offer you a cure that's $2.5 million when I still can't get penicillin for our children with sickle cell disease who live in certain areas in Africa, when I have a rate of severe acute malnutrition that's in the 15 to 20% in children less than five years of age, when a CDC 
a complete blood cell count costs seven dollars which is the equivalent of a week's worth of salary for a family and what i see is the remnants of imperialism colonialism this reality we can do better than this we have to do better.